أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين ولئمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد صلی علی محمد و علی محمد و علی علی بیت طیبین الطاہرین المعصومین و لعنت اللہ علی عدائه مجمعین من یوم عداوتهم الى یوم الدین اما بعد فقد قال اللہ عز و جل فی کتابه الحکیم و هو استق القائلین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم افلم یسیر فی الارض فتکون لہم قلوب یعقلون بها او آذان یسمعون بها آمنا باللہ صدق اللہ العلی العظیم ما صلی علی محمد و آلی محمد اما بعد السلام علیکم جمیعا و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ I begin in the name of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. There is no doubt that it's due to His kindness and generosity that He gives us these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and in glorification of Him Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Then we send our heartfelt condolences to our 12th and living Imam, Imam al Hujja, Ajalallahu Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And to each and every one of you as we gather this evening to commemorate the wafat of Sayyida Fatima al-Ma'asuma bint Musa ibn Ja'far alayhim afdalu salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we each get a chance to go for the ziyarat of Sayyida Ma'asuma in Qum insha'Allah and that we receive her shafa'at in hereafter as well. Sayyidah alayhi salam's life and the history surrounding her life um, is in a way a mystery. There hasn't been that much that has been written about her life. There is a book that's available in English um, that if you would just Google the name Sayyidah Fatima al-Ma'asuma, you would get a book that was, I believe, written by Sister Ma'asuma Jafar when she was studying in Qom about her life and a little bit about the history of her marqad. Um, things that we know, for example, she was born on the first day of Zil Qa'da in the year 173 after Hijra. Now considering that we a few days ago commemorated the wafat of our 8th Imam, Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad in which we gave the bio data of the Imam. So I want to see how well we can calculate and remember. Yeah? That if she was born in the year 173 after Hijra, how much younger does that make her from our 8th Imam? What was the year he was born in? Twice a year we remind ourselves of these dates. Yeah? Huh? 143, very close. 148, good job, Zaid. 148. So if she was born in 173, that makes her how long? How much younger? Ahsan. 25 years younger um, than our eighth Imam alayhi salam. Um, she has many titles that have been given to her. For example, some of the most famous title is that she's been given the title of Ma'asuma. Ma'asuma means the one who is sinless, someone who is Ma'asum. Um, and of course, when we talk about the Isma of Sayyida Fatima alayhi salam, we are talking about Ismatul Sughra. There are what is known as Ismatul Kubra and Ismatul Sughra. Yani the infallibility, the greater infallibility and the smaller infallibility. The greater infallibility is given as far as our ulama tell us to the 14 Masumin. Um, however, there are those personalities 
who lived such a righteous and pious life that they were given isma by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yani the ability to refrain from sins by seeing the reality of the sins. It's not that they couldn't do something wrong, right? But their God consciousness was at such a level that when they saw something wrong, their heart was averse to it. They didn't want to go close to it. And that is a gift in itself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how a human being um, keeps their heart clean. So this is what is known as Ismatul Sughra. And this is the type of isma that was given to Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam as well. So this is one of the titles that has been given to her. Other titles include Al-Tahira, the one who is pure. Um, Al-Hamida, the one who praises. Al-Taqiya, the God-fearing. Al-Radiya, the one who is pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And al mardiya the one whom God is pleased with as well. You can see that these titles are not given by just regular human beings, but rather there some of these titles are given by the Ahlul Bayt alayhi musalam themselves, you know. Um, which again then shows us the great status of Sayyidah Fatima. Because a lot of these titles... Um, that we can give to the Ahlul Bayt because they are all befitting of these titles. But then some of these key personalities like Abul Fadl, like Sayyidah Zainab, like Sayyidah Fatima have been given these titles by the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam themselves to show us um, their immense status. There are many traditions about her life. For example, um, this one is quoted by our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. مَا صَلِّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدْ He says, فَسَتُدْفَنْ فِيهَا That a lady will be buried in it. And in it is referring to Qum here. فَسَتُدْفَنْ فِيهَا إِمْرَأَةٌ مِنْ أَوْلَادِ That a girl, a lady from my family, Tusamma Fatima. That a daughter of mine from my progeny by the name of Fatima will be buried in Qum. فَمَنْ زَارَهَا وَجَبَتْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ yeah? That one who visits her, Jannah will be wajib upon them. And there's another tradition very similar. He says, وَتَدْخُلُوا بِشَفَاعَتِهَا شِيعَةِ الْجَنَّةِ بِأَجْمَعِهِمْ That by her shafa'a, by her intercession, our Shia will enter into paradise. You know, of course, if we were to relate this back to what we talked about last week, and how just a, just the proclamation of being a Shia doesn't guarantee us Jannah. Here, whenever you know Shiatuna fil Jannah, Wallahi Shiatuna fil Jannah, there are traditions like this. We have to realize what is meant by that. Yeah, Layani a real Shia, a true and through and through Shia. You know, and these are not a dime a dozen, right? These are rare. These are precious. Um, and so, one who meets that criteria, then of course, that means they have led a wholesome life. They have led a pious life. Then why wouldn't Jannah be theirs, right? So, no one is ever going to deny Jannah to one who is pious and one who is holy. One of the major events of her life that that is recorded in history um, was when she decided to leave Medina and join her brother in Khurasan. Yeah. This happened in the year 201 after Hijra, and we will conclude with this point that she decided to make this migration. She decided, in other words, to go for the ziyarat of her brother. Yeah? Ziyarat is not something that you just do to visit the dead, right? or to visit those who have a maqamat. Anytime we go and visit somebody, somebody we know, somebody who is dear to us, it is known as a ziyarat. And therefore, one of the major events surrounding her life is the ziyarat that she did to go visit her brother, rather the imam of the time. And you know, I was thinking about that and I thought that this is something that we do as well in our day-to-day -day lives, right? We go for the ziyarat of our imma. We go for the ziyarat of the Prophet in Baqi, in, uh, in Medina, and for our imams in Baqi. And so I thought about what similarities there are. And today, inshallah, because of these this desire that we have to go and we should all have this desire to go for ziyarat and we pray that all of us get time and time again opportunities to go for ziyarat inshallah um, there's something special in ziyarat that we should try and do as often as we can there are traditions that tell us that you should at least once or twice a year go to Karbala, you know. Um, and especially if one can afford it, there is no excuse we will give to God as far as why we didn't go as often as we could for the ziyarat of our imam. So today's lecture, I want to talk about um, what is known as adabu safar, yeah, the etiquettes of traveling. 
right? Um, our religion is truly remarkable, truly remarkable. You know, there are such practical things that they tell us. So today we're going to talk about Adabu Safar, but in future lectures, you know, there is Adabu Nom, the etiquette of sleeping. And you'll be amazed how much has been written about that, you know. Um, sometimes I think if I follow all that, I'll never be able to sleep, you know, because I'll be up all night doing all of the etiquettes of sleeping. But it's amazing, just the practical things that we can do to make our sleep ibadat, right? There is Adabu Mashi, the etiquette of walking. Um, there is the etiquette of how to use the washroom. There is the etiquette of everything, clothing, how to wear clothing, how to put on rings, everything. And inshallah, when time presents itself, we'll be discussing some of the practicalities um, of this. But today we're going to be discussing Adabu Safar. And I'm not sure if the PowerPoint is working, but we had created a PowerPoint. But um, subhanAllah, yeah, is it working? See, if I had asked for something else, it would have happened today, you know. I asked for the PowerPoint to work, alhamdulillah. Salam. Ya Ali. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So for one of the first things, there's five points that we will discuss as far as the adab of safar, right? Now when we talk about adab of safar, we're not just talking about ziyarat, right? So this is vacations, when I go for on a business trip, whatever I do, there are certain adab that I have. So first thing that we have to realize that in Islam, traveling for ziyarat or other journeys is highly recommended. Okay, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verse that I read in the khutbah, Allah He says, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا Have they not traveled in the lands so that they should have hearts with which they understand or ears with which they hear? Right. So traveling actually opens our hearts. Traveling actually cleanses our hearts. Traveling actually makes us understand um, the, the, the finite relationship we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a very recommended part of our journey or our everyday existence. There's another hadith, there's a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, Safiru tasihu wa taghnamu. He says, Travel and you will be healthy and wealthy, right? We often think, Baba, I'm traveling, I'm blowing money, yeah? I'm spending this much money. But actually, we're told that traveling actually increases in our wealth and it increases in our health. Now, you know, it's, it's something to reflect about, you know? There are a couple of points that I want to just hear discuss. We sometimes get into the habit of the hustle and bustle of life where we don't even end up using our vacations correctly. Right? Um, vacations are meant for vacations. Islam encourages that. Islam wants us to take vacations because there is a spiritual purification that can happen with vacations as well. And as these traditions tell us that it increases our wealth. You know, and again, we can analyze this in different ways. You take just the example of Hajj. There's a tradition from Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Where he says, one who goes for Hajj three times in their lives will never taste poverty. Never taste poverty. Yeah? It's a guarantee, right? Now, today, mashallah, Hajj costs about 10,000. Right? But you're making a $30,000 investment versus a promise of never tasting poverty in your life. Make this transaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Put our faith in it and it is a promise. Right? Um, I know sometimes we'll have these doubts as I was thinking this, you know, is that we'll be healthy. But oftentimes, you know, when, when we, we travel, like everybody who's come back from ziyarat felt sick. Yeah? And you're thinking that, okay, how am I actually healthy? Uh, you're not sick, mashallah, Bakir Bhai. Yeah? Um, but how am I healthy? But you know, we, we don't realize that maybe this, this germs that I picked up there actually strengthening my immunity for here. Allahu A'lam. But we're told this, right? And we have to put that faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe just the, the sheer exercise of our ziyarat trips make us healthy, whether it is our bones, whether it is whatever it is, right? Um, I noticed, for example, when I was in, when we went for Hajj, that in Hajj, predominantly, you're praying Salah in marble, on marble, in, in, the, in the Baytul Haram and all of these things. And uh, the praying in that marble for at least 10 days straight actually strengthened my knees, 
Yeah, the knee pain that I usually had for a long time actually went away for a long time when I came back from that Hajj, and now it's back. So you know, it means I have to go again. Yeah, um, because that that it brings about health, it brings about wealth. So the first, you know, the points here is that take these vacations that we have, even if it's a two-day getaway, right? If it's a two-day trip to Niagara, a two-day trip to Dearborn, whatever it is. Let's not just waste around and say, I'll take it one day. I'll take it one day. Let our family enjoy what God has brought in this world for us to enjoy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well wants us to enjoy these things. So the first point that about the adab of traveling is that traveling is highly recommended in Islam. The second point is that the purpose of traveling has to be permissible. Okay, so we're not just talking about just go anywhere you want because Allah says go travel, right? No, the purpose of the travel has to be a journey that is permissible. And there's a tradition from our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al Sadiq alayhi salam. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, where he says traveling should be for three purposes only. Okay, traveling should be for three purposes only. The first one is if one is going to get salvation from that journey. Okay, now what does that mean, right? That salvation can have numerous different connotations to it. For example, it could be physical salvation, where I'm just going to lie around and get some rest. Yeah, nothing wrong with that, right? That is a physical relief that I am seeking, and we all need physical relief, right? We all require just a period of not doing anything, and there's nothing better than traveling and relaxing and enjoying ourselves and getting that type of physical salvation. Another way of that is spiritual salvation, right? When we go for ziyarats, for example, the, the amount of spirituality that we come back with is amazing, right? It's something that um, inspires us and makes us desire to go over and over again. It's very interesting that uh, I was speaking to a couple of brothers only Thursday at JCC when I lectured there. And we were all talking about how, why the, the youth population is not as high as it should be. Where are the youths? Um, honestly, like on Thursday at JCC, I don't think I saw any youth any youth there and that's we're talking about 200 300 people i didn't see anybody there right um and i know that there are there are finals going on right now i was at york their finals are going on and i understand that um and one of the brothers was from the uk and uh, he says you know it's not like that in uk um, especially he gave the example of stanmore and i know many youth in stanmore um, and maybe he was wrong because he's been gone for 18 months now too. But he says that the youth go Thursday night programs, you know. And he's saying that one of the reasons why they do is because the youth have created bonds when they go for ziyarats together. Because, you know, from the UK, it's just a hop and a jump away and you're in ziyarat. For us, it's mashallah... Uh, a mashallah journey, you know. But over there, you have five, six days. You can go for ziyarat. Two days in Karbala, two days in Najaf, one day in Kazmiya, and come back. Um, and those bonds have created something where they say, I want to go hang out with my boys at mosque, right? I want to go hang out with my friends at mosque. Because really, the bonds that you develop in ziyarat or in hajj are, are unbreakable, yeah? You'll have gone with somebody to hajj or ziyarat a long time ago, and you meet, you meet like a... Uh, a jigger dose, yeah, somebody you're close with and you hug them and it's, it's, it's good memories, right? And maybe that's something that we need to think about, you know, uh, where we can plan ziyarat excursions. Because I think our, if our youth are not exposed to the spirituality, um, they won't think of looking for spirituality at the mosque, you know. But if they're exposed to it, then they'll have that desire to come back. So I, one of the ways of salvation is spiritual upliftment. But I think another way of looking at salvation as well is by, for example, securing my akhirah and through helping those in need. So, you know, there are so many missions that happen. There are, there are global kindness missions that go to, um, to uh, Tanzania. There are global kindness missions which go to India. They've gone to Haiti. They go to Karbala. They go to all these different places where you go and volunteer for those who are sick or those who are deprived. And I think that this is one of those... Um, things that we should always encourage each other and our youth in particular um, to go for these missions, even if they're going to miss a couple of weeks of school. Um, I think that there is benefit in that in the long term. So the salvation is one of the first reasons why he said one is permitted to travel. The second reason he says to look after the affairs of your economy, yani your livelihood. So I travel for work. 
right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nowhere you'll find somebody says, no, no, don't travel for work, right? Um, it, it is a permissible travel and one should travel for that. The third reason is for recreation, yeah? just for a vacation. I just want to take a vacation. Now this is Imam Sadiq alayhi salam saying, right? That Allah ma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Um, for recreational purposes. Now the point here is that as long as that recreational purpose is, um, is permissible, right? Like I can't go somewhere and as exciting and as adventurous as it may be, I can't go somewhere when there is a possibility of harm on my iman. Yeah? Whether um, I will have food issues, whether I will have salah issues, whether I will have hijab issues, whether I will have haya issues, whether I will have whatever issues, one is not permitted to go on those type of journeys. You know, so um, I, I have to look to see whether or not there is any possibility of there being damage to my iman. You know, I, we always see these commercials and of beach resorts. And, you know, it looks just like Jannah, you know. Um, and who doesn't desire to go to a beach resort really, right? Where you just, you're just lounging by the beach and you want to go to Jamaica, you want to go to Cuba, you want to go to these places. But then really when you look at those journeys, yeah, um, there, is, uh, there is so much, so many things that can damage your iman there, right? Just being around people who are constantly drunk is one of them. Right? Just being around people who are not dressed appropriately is something else. And these type of things, you know, we just kind of have to say, I'm going to get it in Jannah. Yeah? Um, because I can't put myself in that position where I can damage my Iman. You know, we're not really being naive here. You know? We have to be careful about our Iman. We have to be. Um, and so these are an example. Another example would be Vegas. Yeah? Honestly. There is no need or reason for any Muslim to go to Vegas. None. Zero. Zero. Yeah? Zero, zero, zero. Yeah? Unless you have to go for work, even then try to get out of it. Right? But there's really no need. You're surrounded by haram. I mean, there's nowhere you can go, but you trip on haram. Yeah? Um, so these type of things damage the soul. Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Ma salli ala. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. He says, La yakhrujir rajul fi safarin yakhafu fihi ala dinihi wa salabihi wa salatihi. A man, a human, must never go on a journey in which he has cause to fear for his faith or prayer. Just the cause of fear, he says, one should never go on that journey, Imam says. It's not that like you're saying, oh, um, there's one thing to be sure. Of, of fear, of your faith, and there's one, there's just a possibility. Even if there's a possibility, the Imam says a believer should never go on those type of journeys, right? There's another tradition. Um, it's from our eighth Imam al Rida alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A man comes to him and he says, Yabna Rasulillah, you know, it's like I went to a land. Uh, where it was all ice and snow. I was wondering if he was talking about Canada, you know. He says, I went to a land where there was nothing but ice and snow and I had to do ghusl and I didn't have water to do ghusl. So the Imam alayhi salam guides him eh, and he says that this is what you would do but he's like, my recommendation is don't go there again. Yeah? Because of the difficulty of, of easily practicing your religion. It's not just that I can't practice it but it's more difficult to practice my religion. You know when... When, if something is difficult, you're going to do it a couple of times and then you're going to slack on it yourself. Our cells are like that, right? Um, and imagine if people don't have as high of an iman as you guys. They're going to slack on those responsibilities if their things or the wajibats become difficult. So the second, so that these three things are as far as what type of journey is permissible. And I think um, that... 90% of the travels of today fall under these three categories. We're not being deprived here, you know. Um, and we can always find ways out. You know, you want a private resort, go to Zanzibar. You can get your own private resort there, yeah. Um, you want a pool where your family can go swim, rent a villa in Florida. You can have your own private pool that's, that's entirely blocked. There are ways in which we can enjoy. No one is saying we can't enjoy. You just have to work a little harder. Right? Um, but these are things that the Imam talks about as far as what is permissible. Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. 
la'ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The third point about the adab safar is that prepare before you go. Okay? Um, you have to be planned. You can't just go in there and just say, I'm a wing it. You know, I, I, people do that with ziyarat, and that's different. You know, because in ziyarat you're surrounded by believers, and uh, there's no problem of praying, there's no problem of taharat najasat. You can wing it, you can backpack it, and just go and enjoy your ziyarat. But there are other places that you go to where you have to plan ahead of time, right? And planning is part of our deen. So a couple of things that they tell us about planning. The first is that before you go on your journey, give sadaqa. Give sadaqa. Okay. Um, however much it is, however small it is, but take out sadaqa. There is a tradition from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, commence your journey with the giving of charity, and then leave when this time seems right. For verily, you buy the safety of your journey with charity. Yeah? You buy the safety on your journey with charity. So give this charity before you leave. If you're going for ziyarat, there are other adab khas with ziyarat. Like if you're going for ziyarat, take out ghusl before you go. Um, try and fast for three days before you go. These are things which add to the spirituality of your journey. But here we're talking about general adab will suffer. In fact, ghusl is even recommended for regular travels as well, if I recall correctly. Um, so giving of sadaqa should be something that all of us should be in a habit of doing whenever we travel. The second thing is make sure you look into all the details of your trip. Okay? For example, the prayer timings of where you're going. Right? Now if I'm going, for example, to recite a series of lectures in Minnesota, I know all I have to do is look up the Minnesota Jamaat's website. But if I'm going to, for example, um, Hawaii, I don't know of any Jamaat in Hawaii that I can just pull up their website. So I look at sunrise time, I look at sunset time, I plan. I plan my trip ahead of time, right? To make sure that at least my Salah timings are there. I study the rules of a traveler. So okay, I'm going to be on a plane for 12 hours. How do I recite Salah on a plane? These are our responsibilities, right? It's not like we can say, well, God, why did you make this so hard? No, he, go study these things. These things are available. So know how to pray on a plane, for example. Um, look up halal food restaurants before you go. Right? So that you're not stuck there and figuring it out. These things are so easy for us nowadays. Right? You just go to zabiha.com, put in the city's name and you can get all the halal listings. And it's not like when you're a traveler, you don't have to do the same level of investigation as we would do here in the GTA, for example, where we say, no, show me your certificate. Yeah? Now when you're a traveler, you kind of have to take the word of the people who are there. They look like Muslim, you say salam, they reply back, okay, alhamdulillah, you know, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But do these things. You know, we did this when we went to Paris a um, long, long time ago. Never again to Paris, yeah? Never, wallah, never again. One of the places you visit once and never again. Um, we went there and we looked up all of these things, right? We looked up prayer timings, we looked up halal restaurants, and we looked up bus routes on how to get from our hotel to the... And it made the journey easier, you know? God doesn't want us to go on a place of relaxation and then struggle to maintain the laws of God. That, ah, halal, I have to go here. And no, if, you, if we plan, right, ahead of time, it becomes easier. Also, know what times... I'll have to pray on the plane. There's a really good website that all of us should know about. It's called halaltrip.com. Okay? Um, practical advice, huh? subhanAllah, right? Uh, halaltrip.com. You type, you go to halaltrip.com. You, you type in the city you are departing, the time you are departing, the city you are landing, the time you are landing. It will tell you what time to pray your namaz on that flight. Yeah? And it will tell you what direction to pray as well. So if the plane is going this way, just turn a little bit to the right and pray your salah. It becomes so easy. It becomes so easy. You don't have to call me anymore. Yeah? And tell me, Molana, how do I do this? I was like, Baba, I'll give you halaltrip.com, Allah. Yeah? I'll not do it for you. I'll give you this website. Okay? Um, but these are things that we can do practically to make this journey planned and easier. So this is something that is recommended. Du'as. Supplications, yeah? There's no time to give all the supplications, but I'm just going to read some of the supplications that we have regarding traveling. 
There is dua for exiting and entering the house. There is dua for starting the journey. There is dua for boarding the means of transportation, for dismounting the means of transportation. There is a dua for entering a new town. There is a dua for starting the journey back home. And you know, these are not like dua kumail duas where you're like, whoa. I'm tired now, you have all these du'as. Small two, three liners that we just recite, we can carry with them, we can print it out ahead of time, so that every step becomes godly. You understand what I'm saying? That I'm seeking the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout this journey. So that's the third point about um, pre-journey. The fourth is while you're on your journey now. Okay. Um, I hope we're all paying attention. I was told the PowerPoints will help you pay attention. Yeah. Um, so the fourth point is while we are on our journey, okay? What was the first thing? Huh? I don't understand. Huh? Yeah, the purpose. There's there's purpose in traveling. God recommends it. What's the second point? Huh? Permissible journeys. Yeah. Third point? Planning. Good. Fourth is while you're on your journey. The fourth point here, the first thing we are told is that if you travel with a group of people, even if it's like three people, there has to be one person in charge. Okay? And this is Islamic adab, yeah? We're, we're not even talking, this is beautiful. I'm telling you, our religion is so kamal, yeah? Um, the tradition is from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala. Muhammad. He says, "Ida kana thalathatun fi safarin amiru ahadahum." He says, "If three people are traveling, they must place one of them in charge." Right? So this could be your own family, right? If my wife is more logistically minded, I'm gonna place my wife in charge of our journey. As men, we shouldn't feel bad about this at all, right? But if you are, for example, more uh, logistically oriented, then yes, then you become in charge. But someone has to be in charge of the journey, right? Because we understand how this can happen. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? And you end up doing nothing on that journey, right? Uh, what do you want to eat? I don't know. What do you want to eat? And then you end up eating nothing on that journey, right? Uh, not really, but you know what I'm saying though, right? So you have to keep one person in charge. The second point is that the one in charge is the servant of the group. Yeah? So it's not that now you're in charge, you're saying, you do this, and you do this, and you do this. No, you're in charge, you do everything. Yeah? You make sure that those who kept you in charge are taken care of. We get again a tradition from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah, Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We, come on, this is an exciting lecture. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, Sayyidul Qawm Khadimuhum Fis Safar. Yeah? The, the leader of the group is the servant of the group in the travel, right? And this is what you see really if you've ever gone with a Hajj group or a Ziyarat group, the leaders of that group really just serve the group so spectacularly well, you know? Um, and same thing happens even if I'm traveling with my family, if I've been taken that responsibility of being in charge, I make sure that they are not in any discomfort, right? So we take that as an added bonus or an added responsibility. The third thing we are told then is to be courteous and friendly with those we are traveling with. Now this is not as easy as it seems, you know, because you really know the reality of people when you travel with them. You really get to know people, you know. You either live with somebody or you travel with them and you will know the reality of an individual. Or as I, or you study with somebody. Yeah? These three things, I think, you can really get the, the true haqiqah of an individual. There is again a tradition um, that is recorded that Luqman said to his son, and I'll read just the English, that when you travel in the company of people, consult with them frequently about each of your affairs. Yani, how are you? Do you need anything? Yeah? Is your health okay? Do you need some water? Consult with them. How are things going today? Do you need anything? Any difficulty along your journey? Make them smile often. Yeah? Make the people you are traveling with smile often. Be generous in sharing your provisions with them. Right? If they don't have something, you give them if you have it, for example. Share with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us back more on that. So this is the third point. Then he says, when they call you, answer them. And when they ask for your help, assist them. So if somebody is reaching out for help, never let them down on a journey. Especially, you know, on a journey... 
people's mindsets are different, you know. They're not in their comfort. Some people panic. Some people are not comfortable. So you try and make them as relaxed as possible. Imagine if everyone did this, you know. This would be just a remarkable journey. Um, and then he says, try to outdo them in three things. The first is long periods of silence, in abundance of prayer, and open-handedness with, with them, and with whatever you possess of a riding animal, wealth, or food. So try to outdo each other, right? By moments of silence, by ibadat, um, by sharing with them. But we have to learn to be kind and courteous on this journey. The fourth point is, and this is something really important, bring back something for your family from your journey. Yeah? Bring back something for your family. Never come back empty-handed. Never come back empty-handed, right? Uh, again, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ida kharaja ahadukum ila safarin, thumma qadima ala ahlihi, fal yuhdihim, wal yutrifuhum, walau hijara. Yeah? He says that if you are traveling and you come back to your family, you should bring them back a gift or a novelty, even if it may be a stone. Yeah? Like you just pick up a stone and you bring them back. You know? But whatever it is, you know, if you have to stop at duty free on your way back because you didn't get time, pick up something for your family. While you have been gone, they have missed you. Yeah? Um, they have been longing for you to come back. You know, sometimes when we travel, because we are so occupied with our travels, we don't realize that our families are literally counting days and, and hours and minutes for us, right? Um, so when you come back with something, um, it, it adds a level of happiness within that house. There is no resentment in that house. This is something that we should all try and do. Even if you travel for a day or two for work, this applies for work too, right? That if you travel for work, Bring back something for your children or your family um, as this is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, uh, salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The fifth point is, um, if we can just put the fifth slides up, reflect on your trip after you come back. Okay? Um, the first thing is make notes of your reflection. You know, there, I, I may go somewhere and... They, even though it was a good vacation, there were some parts of that vacation that disrupted my soul, for example. You know, my soul didn't feel comfortable being there, for example. But it was fun, right? Um, there was beautiful scenery, whatever, but there was parts of it which I, I didn't feel comfortable being around. Put that down in paper, right? Or type it in some notes where you have it. Because, you know, the soul, what happens is that after a certain period of time, your soul forgets the bad and just remembers the good. So you, you'll get tempted, let's go there again. That was fun. But if you look back at your notes and you said, oh, you remember this happened there? Yeah. So make notes on your reflection. If you went, for example, to Ziyarat and something really worked for you in Ziyarat, Make a note of that so you can repeat that next time you go, right? Otherwise, we'll have to, we don't have to start from zero every time we travel. And I think additionally, we can then share our experiences with others, right? That, oh, you're going somewhere? Um, look at this is the places you go. This is the, the websites you should look at. These are the food places you should go to. All of these things so that we can make the burden lighter, for our brothers and sisters. And you know, when we do these things, something remarkable happens, right? The journey um, becomes a godly journey. I don't care if I'm going to um, a, a recreational journey, or I'm going for a ziyarat journey, or I'm going for a work trip. But if I follow these principles that have been taught to us in Islam, this becomes a divine journey. And when something becomes a divine journey, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks after us throughout that journey, right? And even if something bad happens, I recognize that this was God looking after me, right? That He will take care of me and no matter what happens. And this is the type of journey that Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam went to. Yeah? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Yeah? That was the purpose of her journey. Her journey was to go and meet the Imam of the time. Yeah? Yes, it was her brother, but it was the imam of the time. And therefore, when she went on this journey, she was walking 
she was doing the ziyarat of the imam and she was walking in the wings of angels literally throughout this journey you know and this is where we get that similarity our eighth imam alayhi salam went to was forced to migrate to Khurasan and he left in the year 200 after Hijrah. And in the year 201 after Hijrah, Sayyida Fatima along with her brothers decided to join the Imam in Khurasan. And so they left in the year 201 after Hijrah. In the journey towards Khurasan, it is said that the caravan of Sayyida Fatima was ambushed by Abbasid army. And many of her brothers lost her life, their lives on that journey. And in that journey, we are told that the Imam alayhi, that Sayyida Fatima alayhi salam was poisoned. Um, and the effects of that poison prevented her from reaching her brother in Khurasan. Yeah? And so she was directed and towards Qom, where she lived for a few weeks in Qom until um, her soul left her remarkable um, this this world, and what is remarkable about her is that we are told that um, two imams came and prayed on her body. Both Imam Al Rida and Imam Al Jawad alayhimussalam were present in the recitation um, of the salat of this pious lady, and this is why we go for that ziyarat to meet this lady. You know, today I want to, with a few minutes of masaib, talk about the journey of the kafila of Zainab back towards Medina. Yeah? These are different journeys that the Ahlul Bayt have taken. Some of them have led to much difficulty. But now the difficulty for Zainab alayhi salam was coming towards an end finally, as they were returning back to Medina. You know, my brothers and sisters, Khutaba mentioned that after they wept on the, on the graves of Imam al Hussein and the Shuhada of Karbala, Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam looks towards his family and he says to his aunt, Ya Ammati Zainab, it is time for us now to go back towards Medina. As they gathered the women and children together, Khutaba say that they could not find one lady. Zainab alayhi salam looks around and she says, where is Rubab? How come we cannot find Rubab anywhere? It is said there was Rubab standing alone by herself. They say to her, Ya Rubab, it is time for us now to go back to Medina. The reply of Rubab was that for what will I go back to Medina? I have left my daughter in Sham and I have left my husband and son in Karbobala. Ah, they decide and they gather and they head towards Medina. It is said as they reach the outskirts of Medina, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam tells a poet by the name of Bishr, O oh Bishr, go into Medina and let them know what happened on the Isle of Rasulullah. It is said as soon as Bishr enters into Medina, he is stopped by a lady, a lady in a niqab. This lady asks, O oh Bishr, where is my son Hussein? Bishr says, what is your name? She says, Ana Ummul Baneen. And Aina Aina Ibn Al Hussein. Where is my son Hussein? When Bishr hears that this is Ummul Baneen, he says, That I give you my condolences on the musiba of your son Uthman. Ummul Baneen replies, I did not ask you about Uthman. I am asking you about my son Hussein. She says, Azamakumullah, I am asking you where I am giving you my condolences on the death of your son Jafar. Again, Umul Banin says, I did not ask about Jafar. Where is my son Hussein? Until finally, it is said, Bishr said, I give you condolences on the death of your son Abbas. Wa Husayna. When Umul Banin heard that Abbas. Abbas was no more. Ummul Banin did not ask about Hussein alayhi salam.